past Saturday, I went to summer camp. Now, uh, for those of you who have known me for a long time, you know that my heart belongs to Camp Onus. Well, this weekend I cheated on Camp Onus. <laughs> and I attended the 50th anniversary celebration at Camp Timber Talks, where my wife, Laura, spent many summers. Dear Mom, guess what? Yesterday, my cabin had lights check, and at the end, I was the only one without lights. <laughs> Again. <laughs> we did the shampoo and made a spa day out of it. I'm in Sunrise Cabin, and my counselors are Kate, S, and Anna. It's the best cabin ever. I love you. Here it is. What is it about the summer camp experience in those few weeks away that goes so deep under the skin? Not many people rave about their schools or neighborhoods, but when they talk about camp. According to the National Camp Association, over 6 million children attend summer camp every year. I was one of them, and like many of them, camp has completely changed my life. As a camp counselor, I have seen countless children grow and mature in as little as five days of being away from home. So what makes the experience so powerful? Through the drama, what I did during summer vacation by Michael Eisner, poetry, tonight by Amy Ludwig Vanderwater, prose, what's the magic of camp by Michael Thompson, I call it camp by Elizabeth Gates, I think I finally get it by Donna Donovan. This weekend I went to summer camp by Peter Slutsky and P.S. I Hate It Here by Diane Corrine. <laughs> a program <coughs> capturing those essential childhood moments and their translation into adulthood. First, it is absolutely magical for kids to be away from their parents. The sweetest, most satisfying moments of life are almost always when we are away from home. Why? Well, apparently there's a little Harry Potter in every child, yearning to be an orphan, at least for a while. Children are suddenly free to experience themselves anew. They face challenges and accomplishments that are theirs alone. It doesn't matter what your parents think. It belongs to you. Dear Mom and Dad, I made the team for soccer. I love camp! <laughs> okay, I'll give you an example. Think of the best thing you can. Now multiply it by a thousand. Can't. I love you, Noah. We lie in sleeping bags, wearing woven bracelets on our ankles and spilling giggles into cabin air. Our jokes swirl with secrets told by long ago campers and our words float warm from bump to bump, year to year. We have new batteries in our flashlight, marshmallow goo in our hair, and our hearts are carved with the music of Paddles dipping in water. I remember my very first canoe trip. I was terrified. <laughs> okay, we were venturing out in what seemed to be uncharted territory, <laughs> perhaps never to be seen again. You know, every aspect of it was intimidating, but especially the idea that somehow our survival depended on us doing stuff, and doing it together, and doing it right. <laughs> Of course, steadily, terror gave way to triumph, and I returned with an indescribable feeling of achievement. I think I was seven years old the first time I went to a sleepaway camp. The first time that I was away from home by myself. Oh, I can just remember my feelings of self-importance as I walked myself to and from my classes that I had to pick all by myself. You know, that was the first step for me toward independence leadership, and the person who I became. You know, after that summer, I started school. I made new friends. And I spent 11 months looking forward to camp. I went into the experience pretty skeptical. After all, entering a rival camp is tantamount to crossing enemy lines during a heated battle. Okay, you just don't do it! <laughs> Setting foot on another camp's property should only be done late at night. Shaving cream in hand so that one can properly mark its territory and ensure that everyone wakes up knowing that I was here. <laughs> Dear Mom and Daddy Katie, right now our cabin and Cornell cabin are in war. We are in war because we mess up our entire cabin, so we're going to TV the cabin and put the beds on the ceiling. <laughs> Good enough about me. I want to hear from you. How's the dog? How's Katie? House of Flowers? Well, I love you all. Sam. There's a great comfort in predictability. <clears throat> Knowing exactly what to expect, expect makes you feel safe. And safe is good. Well, a 
camp, you will wake up to a bugle and a nice good morning, campers. Rick will risk his life on top of the bus for the sake of the camp photo. You will sing about a yodeling Austrian and see a skit about the world's ugliest man. You, you sleep on the ground, square dance, throw an egg at someone. Your cottage cheese is applauded and you eat as a family three times a day in a society where families rarely eat here. Camp is very predictable and loaded with traditions that, instead of making children tired of camp, becomes one of those factors that makes them long to return. Oh, the lessons I learned. On these canoe trips, we could never survive the first day if we didn't first practice teamwork, handle adversity, listen well, and and maintain a sense of humor. You know what, I'm sure it's no surprise that these attributes don't just apply to canoe trips. They represent keys to success in life. And you just can't learn them spending your summers playing video games. I can honestly say that I am who I am today because of my experiences at summer camp. Okay, everything that I do, every call, every meeting, every interaction, I take with me the lessons I learned when I was a young kid in Oxville, Pennsylvania. I lead with humor and with humility, and I try to treat every individual with kindness. You know, I care deeply about rich personal relationships, and I try to infuse comedy, banter, levity, and song into situations where they are I know this may sound odd, after all, I am 31 years old, and before this weekend I hadn't been to camp in over a decade. But it's the way I operate, and it has informed my outlook, attitude, and approach to life. Two mom, I have a mouse named Ed and a chipmunk named Herman. I love you when I've seen you in four days! My toilet never works. I made a five new friends! From mine. <laughs> Right now, all over the world, there are millions of little kids getting ready to fall asleep after a busy, crazy, dirty, fun day at camp. It was amazing for me to think about this as I sit in my apartment in Brooklyn, next to my wife and my fully adult existence. However, it's even more amazing for me to think that just a few days ago, I sat around a campfire with hundreds of people of all ages, many who grew up together, some who had just met, and a large number of husbands who were just along for the ride. And we held hands, and we sang songs. For a moment, we were all kissing. You know, that doesn't happen a lot in the real world, but no matter how old you are, or how long it's been since you've slept under the stars, there's a comfort in knowing that you can always go home to camp. At camp, I have never once felt like I've had to be someone I'm not, just to please someone or to fit in with a certain group. You know, that's why I think camp is so important for a girl. At camp, I always felt like I mattered. I learned to take care of myself and to take care of others. Okay, at summer school, you gain knowledge for your academic future. In a summer job, you learn work ethic. But at summer camp, you learn to love other people. You learn to love yourself. Finally, if camps are successful, they create a private world with its own rules and rituals and magic. Deep down, not only do children yearn to be Harry Potter, but they want a Hogwarts. They want to have their own harrowing adventures with no apparent safety net. Camps have the ability to create that world that belongs only to a child and his or her friends. Now that is magic. If I had it my way, every girl would have what I have and learn what I got to learn. You know, every girl would have that place where they could go to be themselves for a while. A place where they feel like they matter. A place where they can become artists or athletes or geniuses. You know, all the shy girls up there. But find that place for them where they can become leaders. Like I did. As it turns out, there is a place like that. Some call it paradise. Some call it utopia. Some call it heaven. I call it king. William, I'll be giving you your time signals.
Do you understand what the time signals are? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Should we know before this, I did not choose this quotation. John chose it <laughs> for me. So I have no clue what is in this paper folder right now. So let's hope John's being nice. <laughs> Time begins. Thirty seconds. One minute. Kim Jong-un is moderately insane. Well, actually, perhaps he's really, really, really insane. Or he's brilliant. I guess only time will tell to see what he is truly doing. But one thing's for sure is that Kim Jong-un really doesn't want to be himself. He wants to be someone else. Now, whether that person is Dennis Rodman or whether it's his father, it's very clear that he is, well, uncomfortable in his, well, rather large pants. Now, the important thing is that Kim Jong-un is constantly trying to be someone else, someone that's powerful, someone that can actually tell the United States that they're in charge, but frankly, this just won't happen, which brings us to today's quotation. My one regret in life is that I am not someone else, by Woody Allen. <laughs> what this quotation means, pretty obviously, is that, well, the grass is always greener on the other side. And we can see this in two key examples, the first in political history and the second in economic history. So first, let's look at political history. In the first example, we have two main examples, that of Ron Paul and Sylvia Berlusconi. So first, Ron Paul. Almost everyone in this room knows who Ron Paul is. In fact, some people were quite behind Ron Paul when he's ran for president the past you know, five, six, seven, like 40 times probably. <laughs> the important thing, though, is that, well, Ron Paul He's not been very successful when it comes to actually counting the votes. I mean, people have voted for him, but he hasn't really won, well, much of anything. But the important part is that he really has radically changed the Republican Party. The supporters of Ron Paul are sad because, well, Ron Paul is not in the White House right now. Because, quite simply, the grass is green on the other side for them. They fail to recognize that Ron Paul has galvanized the Republican Party and changed basically how that entire party operates. They have changed the fundamental view of the Republican Party, despite the fact they haven't won any votes, even though they may want that. The second person to look at is Silvio Berlusconi. Now, most of you probably don't know who Silvio Berlusconi is. He was the Prime Minister of Italy recently, but he was rather infamous. He was known for doing pretty terrible things, like being involved with underage women and partying with actually Vatican officials. He wasn't the greatest guy. <laughs> but the important part is that, well, Silvio, despite the fact he was a terrible person, actually ran the country pretty well. And nowadays, with their new Prime Minister, Mario Monti, Italy, well, it's not doing so hot. Silvio Berlusconi, although he may have been a terrible, corrupt human being that did very terrible things, he sure knew how to run a, run a country. And that's why it's very important that we can see that despite the fact that Silvio, you know, is a terrible guy, the grass is always greener on the other side. So let's look at the second area, that of economics. Now, because you don't know me, I like economics quite a bit, so bear with me. And there are two key examples that prove the grass is always greener on the other side. The first is the 1980s economic crisis in the United States of America, and the second is the East Asian currency shortage in the 1990s. So the first example, the 1980s. Some of you were alive back then. Not many of you. To make it with you a little, but just a couple of you were alive then. But the important thing is that during this time, the economy wasn't doing so well. We're talking about the early 80s at this point, and a lot of people were, well, rather angry. 
Unemployment was high, inflation was rising, and a lot of people didn't know what to do. So the Federal Reserve executed a plan that they felt confident would work. It would take some time, but they knew it would. As a result, unemployment went up, and well, people got rather angry at the Federal Reserve's decisions. However, after five or six years, the economy started performing rather well. With the 80s, the Reagan Revolution, the ones that Republicans always claimed was, you know, our idea. <laughs> Basically what happened is although the economy was looking terrible, a couple people with calm heads made the right decision. The grass looked definitely greener on the other side in the early 1980s. But in the late 1980s, everyone certainly was happy that the grass they had in front of them was brown during the early 80s. <laughs> the second example is that of the East Asian currency shortage in the early 1990s. Now, a couple of you, of you know what this is. It doesn't really matter. Basically, Western investors came in and said, hey guys, here's a great idea. Why don't you float your currency in the open market? Because frankly, the countries in East Asia were tired of always playing second fiddle to the United States, and to China, and Japan, and India. They were going to take the step to become a world, world-renowned economy. So what did they do? They floated their currency. Just very the economic details. The important thing is that their currency was being actively traded, like a commodity. However, this can lead to terrible, 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 terrible things, and it did, causing the collapse of several East Asian economies. They wanted their country to be better, but they paid the heavy price. They saw the green grass. They didn't know it was a really tall fence to climb over, and it really hurt falling off of that fence. <laughs> <laughs> so returning to today's quotation, my one regret in life is that I'm not someone else by Woody Allen. What this quotation means is that the grass is always greener on the other side. And we saw this in two areas. First, we looked at political history. We looked at Ron Paul, and we looked at Sylvia Berlusconi. Then second, we looked at economic history. Look at the 1980s fuel shortage crisis and the 1990s East Asian currency shortage. Kim Jong-un wants to be someone else. Don't let anyone fool you. He's not comfortable in the shoes he currently had. He wasn't comfortable in the shoes he had to fill. He just wants to be someone that's successful, someone that can do something great in life. And when you start thinking about that, isn't what we all want to do? Don't you start to feel that maybe he isn't insane as much as he is just, well, a human being? Thank you.
you sure you won't be mad if I stay? Whatever, just have fun. See, I was hoping that he would come back with me without me having to beg for his attention, but I knew he wouldn't. Okay, see you later. He turns and melts back into the crowd. I'm snapped awake by my mother's voice yelling frantically, Todd! Todd, oh God, somebody call an ambulance! I spring to life, glancing at Brooke still asleep beside me, and my, my head is pounding and my heart is racing. I run through the door at the other side of our suite just as my father whispers, Kristen, he's gone. No, 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 no. I run to Todd's side, lifting his head, listening for breath, begging for a heartbeat, any sign of life in my husband's body. But there's nothing. Everything is a blur as the paramedics arrive. And a glimmer of hope shoots through my body. I mean, he's only 30 years old. Surely they can save him. The paramedics lift Todd's body out of the bed and something snaps inside of me. I know I am looking at a dead man. My husband is dead. His body is slack and lifeless, it is not responding as the paramedics force air into his lungs. My eyes well with tears as I try to comprehend the scene that's unfolding before me. My husband is dead. See, I have been raised to believe that God was a loving God. But if he is so loving, how is he letting this happen? I mean, I was staring at my husband, my best friend. Friend, my everything, dead on a hotel room floor. His body limp, his spirit already gone. Hello, ma'am. This is Chad Jutes from the Detroit Lakes Police Department. I have the results of your son of your husband's autopsy. Please, please don't let it be alcohol poisoning. I thought to myself. I didn't want his death to be caused by something self-induced. Yeah, uh, it's great to hear from you. Uh, we wanted some results before the visitation. My jaw clenches as I wait for the results. Well, it was an acute myocardial infarction, or a heart attack. What? Is there any other information? I wanted some information about why an apparently healthy 30-year-old would just drop dead of a heart attack. Yes, there was a 99% blockage of the left descending artery. Later learn that this artery is called the widow finger. Officer Jukes reads more medical terminology, but I have heard all that I can hear. As the timing hangs up, I'm happy that I have some information, but I'm also incredibly angry. I'm angry at Todd for leaving me, I'm angry at the healthcare system for not catching this, and I am angry. God, I mean, what kind of God would do something like this? The pallbearers close the casket. We let down the aisle. I follow my body overly erect and take my designated seat as the pastor breaks the silence. Let us pray. Many more words follow, but I hear none of them. I sit staring at my husband's casket, and my faith in God evaporates. All I can keep thinking is, why? Why, God? Why do something like this? Why leave me without a husband, his parents, without a son, Brooke, without a daddy? More Bible verses, more words, but... I hear none of them as the anger and sadness threaten to overcome me. The pastor's words cease. The pallbearers lift the casket and put it in the hearse. I watch it drive down the street, driving away with my husband and my life. With the funeral behind me, I was supposed to get back to the everyday rise and grind of life, but life as I knew it was just over. There were moments where I just wanted to die. I mean, I'd become a total cynic, practically denounced God, and felt like I had no reason to live. Except my daughter. See, all this anger.
anger I had was just directed at this entity of God, and at this point, I wasn't even sure if he existed. So I knew I needed to search for some truth. Truth that would help me make sense of my life and help me come back to life. I had an aha moment as I read more about Christianity. See, I knew that all Christian denominations believed that Jesus was the Son of God, you were supposed to follow the Ten Commandments, blah, 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 but to be honest with you guys, I had no idea that Jesus was a real person. I know, so simple, right? I mean, I guess I always just thought that he was just some character that Christians made up to personify their morals, but he is a real person. Paradise, heaven, the afterlife, the other side, what have you. There is something after we die. We don't just cease to exist. As I started working on my beliefs, thoughts, and actions, the world began to make sense again. I know now that even though Todd is gone in body, his spirit is with me every single day. He's heard what I've had to say, and I've heard him. It's like this long day is finally over. And I can finally sleep again. Todd, your death has changed me. I am no longer even close to who I was before you died. I need to make my life worth something again. I need to make you proud. I promise I'll do everything I can to fulfill this goal and make something of this life that I have left. So when we meet again, we will have so much to talk about. Love, Kristen. There is a scourge sweeping our nation. Something so terrible, it will lead to the halt of all social progression. No, it's not Justin Bieber. <laughs> He's our savior. <laughs> no, this can be found at your local bar in every frat house in America. Chicks, dude, up top, bro! Bros. And while many people dismiss bros as a silly and sometimes funny demographic, they are killing American society as we know it. <laughs> to fully understand this terrible problem in society, we must first understand what a bro truly is. Then look at the serious problems that they legitimately pose on society before finally looking at the necessary solutions. And just say no to bro. <laughs> but first, Let's take a closer look at what bros truly are by looking at the definitions and then looking at moments of bro culture. So first, let's define what a bro truly is. Now, according to an Atlantic article published October 17, 2012, there is no real definition for a bro. So, like a good little college student, I turn to UrbanDictionary.com. <laughs> a bro is an alpha male idiot. <laughs> Inarticulate, belligerent, and talk about nothing but chicks and beer, and identify excessively with brand names. Bros are those white guys blasting hardcore rap in their mom's SUV. <laughs> Bros are also very well known for being extremely sexist, and will say and do anything to bag a chick for the night. Bros also can be identified by their brocabulary. Bros are very proud of their bro communication. <laughs> Basically, what you do is you take a syllable out of a word and inject bro. <laughs> Super clever! <laughs> Examples of this are brosif, bronia, bromo sapien, bro bama, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> and my personal favorite, bro side and king of the bro shit. <laughs> Related 
related to it. <laughs> Another important bro in history was King Henry VIII. He pulled the it's not me, it's you card on six different wives. He had the best clothes, had the best parties, until he got stinking fat and died of syphilis. No bros, this could be you. <laughs> The introduction of ESPN Sports Center, National Lampoon's hangover, uh, the Animal House, The Hangover, and the character Barney Stinson on the television show How I Met Your Mother. Barney Stinson wrote the bro code, which is the code to which bros their, live their lives, and encouraged men everywhere to lie to women to sleep with them. A uh, proud and noble history it is. <laughs> so now that we understand what bros are, let's look at how bros are actually posing problems on society by first looking at how they hurt women and then looking at how they hurt other people. Now, it's no question that feminists have beef with everything. <laughs> there is a There's a just cause here. According to the Bro Code, which is an actual book written by actual humans, and was actually on the New York Times bestseller list for four months, <laughs> highlights a lot of really sexist behavior. Bro code article number one, bros before a hoax. Article 17, a bro will never go out of his way for a woman unless he wants to get with her. Article 37, a bro will never let another bro date a fatty. <laughs> Article 38, <laughs> A bro will never let a, another bro hit on a chick who is below 6 out of 10 on the Hoffman scale unless he wants to bang her. Article 69. I don't need to go there. <laughs> now, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that men should not treat women like objects, but men should not treat women like objects. <laughs> According to AmericanProgress.org, last access, January 2013, Women still make 77 cents for every dollar that a man makes. Now, I'm not saying that bros are the inherent cause of sexism in our society, but I am saying that tolerance of sexist behavior is a huge contributor. Not cool, bro. <laughs> but bros don't only hurt women, they also inherently hurt themselves. According to Will Courtney's article from the Journal of Social Science and Medicine, published in July of 2011, Men are much more susceptible to outside factors and being influenced by them, like television and movies and music. And this makes them much more likely to engage in dangerous activity, like alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and tasing your no-no squares to see if it hurts. <laughs> Have you seen that show on MTV? I mean, seriously? <laughs> now, Will Courtney goes on to link this and say that this is one of the reasons why men die younger than women. Which means being a bro kills you. <laughs> Science has spoken. So now that we understand these problems, let's look at the necessary solutions. Today I have devised a completely unique 12-step bro recovery plan. Step number one, admit that brodom can kill our society. Step two, realize there's a higher power besides beer and hair gel. <laughs> Step three, decide there is equality at all levels. Step four, purge ourselves of all pickup lines and obnoxious high fives. <laughs> Step five, admit we have harmed ourselves through a full life of bro gravity. You guys in the back, take notes. Seriously. <laughs> Step six, dispose of douchey brand name clothing. Step seven, humbly ask women to forgive our shortcomings. <laughs> Step eight, make a list of chicks we have unethically been with. Step nine, apologize to all we have offended, friends, family, and or small dogs. You know what you did. <laughs> Step ten, take a job selling feminine hygiene products. <laughs> Step eleven, ask Oprah for power and strength. <laughs> and finally, find fellow bros, rinks, and repeat. <laughs> These 12 steps are essential to the bro recovery plan and the health of all bros in our society. You can take steps today to initiate these problems and help fix them in our society. But in all seriousness, this is actually a problem. Now, there are actually solutions. See, the real problem with bros is that men are being gender stereotyped into roles that they're not meant to be in. And there are two main solutions. We can look to Andrea Broman's book, 
Fro, Van. I was skeptical of the name at first, but her book, Breaking Gender Bar Binaries, highlights two main things that we as individuals can do to prevent gender stereotyping in our society. And the first is starting with our children. Now, we need to stop encouraging gender stereotypical play. It's totally cool if girls want to play sports and with trucks. It's okay if boys want to play with dolls. And then our children can grow up to see that men don't have to be boorish and hit on women to get attention. And women can grow up to be less pressured, sexually and otherwise, by the men in their society. Next, we need to look to changing our language about sexism. If you hear someone in a bar telling a sexist joke, you roll up your newspaper and you say, no! <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> These two steps are easy things that we can incorporate into our daily lives. So please... Stop the gender stereotypical behavior, and maybe we could kill Brodom in our society altogether. So today, we have looked at what bros truly are, the problems that they pose in society, and finally, look at the necessary solutions. Justin Bieber can't save us all. <laughs> so we need to take the necessary steps. Be you, not some deluded groupthink version of you. And just say no to bro.